All right, a very good afternoon to you and your welcome to the program. It's good afternoon, Ghana, and uh, it's a Wednesday, the 28th of September 2022. Well, we have uh, another very interesting interview for you coming up today, and that really is associated with the NDC. The NDC has started its primaries. Uh, they have actually started from the constituency levels. Uh, the locals are all working in electing its local executives. At the national level, there are communications, there are seeming tensions and, you know, some uh, discussions that are ongoing considering, you know, some of the personalities that are filled in, in uh, or at the national level uh, executive positions. Today we, we are, are actually glad to have one of the top most hopefuls, Elvis Efri Ankara, who is joining me on the platform this afternoon. We're going to have a chit chat with him, let's see how the campaign is going. How is he facing uh, the pressure that is coming down because a lot of people are talking about the contention between him and some other personalities probably vying for the same position right let's see how the ndc is handling this and how they will go through the next phase of its primaries this is good afternoon ghana we'll be back shortly Welcome back to the program. It's good afternoon, Ghana. And like I said earlier on, today we're having an interaction with Elvis Efriye Ankara, one of the pillars of the NDC, at least today. He is one of the firebrands. He has been through uh, the thick and thin. If you have been around in politics for a while, you know what I'm talking about, and you believe that that is really the personality I'm describing. He attended some school bid that somehow I wanted to attend, but I didn't get a chance because they came in late. <laughs> <laughs> when some school be taking me already. That's Okwapeman Secondary School. <laughs> anyway, you're welcome. Thank you. Good thank you. To you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us Good today. Good to see you. Good your see you. modern studio. Yes, you haven't yes. been here before, have you? No um, I have, but it was a different setup. Oh. Yes. Okay. This is really cool. Now you have a real setup. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, welcome. Thank you. Well, thank so you. let's go through a little bit of profile about uh, Elvis and Free Yankra, and then we we'll get into the interview. Okay, I think I should have it on one of the screens soon. Okay, so that's the a bit of a brief about him uh, you have on the screen. Let me just get it here, and then I can read it. I thought I was going to talk about myself. You will talk about <laughs> it. Let's, let's help the viewers so that we can, we can move a bit faster. Okay. So in March 2029, February 2018, he was appointed as Deputy Minister for Local Government and Rural Development under the President Mills. February 2013, he was appointed as Minister of Youth and Sports by the President John Dramani Mahama. July 2014, January 2017, he was appointed Minister of State of uh, at the office of the president and honorable Elvis Fianca also together with a team of private and public sector experts and under the leadership and guidance of his excellency professor john Infanza tamils his soul rest in peace and excellency john dramani mahama established the local enterprises and skills development program called lesdep now lesdep was a bold initiative that focused on training and unemployed most especially the youth to acquire viable skills to make them self-employed within the short shortest possible time in the localities now in order to enhance their socio-economic conditions as well this initiative offered jobs to the thousands of youth nationwide some entrep entrepreneurs others zonal district municipal polit uh, metropolitan and then regional and national coordinators as well Okay, so it goes on to say in education and academia, he has a Bachelor of uh, Arts Honours degree in English and Theatre Arts uh, in 1992 to 1996, Legon, Masters of Arts degree in International Affairs 2002, and um, that's last year, Legon, Legon as well. And then training course, Leadership Risk uh, corruption and Security in 2015 at the Defence Academy of United Kingdom, UK. Graduate program uh, in Transforming Leadership for 21st Century Africa 2015, John F. Kennedy School of Governance at the Harvard University and Aga Khan Univers uh, University Graduate School of Media and Communications. Alice, you also have Harvard, huh? Have, have a DNA, Kobe. Too, oh, it's important. <laughs> <you should. laughs> so, political profile 
uh, part one, it says the NDC parliamentary candidate Ayawaso West Wogon in 2000 elections in opposition in 2002. He had uh, an offer to work with ECOWAS, but opted to join the campaign team of the late Professor John Evans Atamils, rather. So he was the deputy campaign spokesperson for the Professor John Evans Atamils' presidential candidate race in 2002. Now, 2004, he became the national deputy campaign manager for the NDC and the Atamils' presidential candidate in 2004 general elections. And 2005, elected deputy general secretary in charge of operations. Now, over the past 22 years, Elvis Afrianka has been extensively involved in the political campaign uh, in the NDC in Ghana. Within the period, he has successfully managed two presidential candidates' elections uh, in the National Democratic Congress NDC and two National Democratic uh, National Presidential Campaigns in 2008 and 2012 general elections in Ghana. In 2008 general elections in Ghana, he was Deputy General Secretary for the National Democratic Congress NDC in charge of operations and NDC won the elections and the Tamils became President of Ghana in January 2009. Okay, I have something here. It says that uh, it's, it's a brief, but let me go through this one. In 2012, that's a lot, but we'll cut it short. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in 2012 general elections in Ghana, he was a national campaign coordinator for the National Democratic Congress uh, and John Dramani Mahama presidential campaign. Within a very short period of three months, he successfully coordinated the campaign and the NDC won the 2012 general elections in the first round victory. Honorable Efri Ankara also, also had been instrumental in the formation of various political and civil society groups, as well as helping and mentoring young people to establish various forms of businesses and organizations. After the NDC lost the elections in 2000, he, together with young comrades, formed the NDC Youth Forum, which was a platform for advocacy and mobilization of youth to face the Kufour regime. Now, um, he was also very key in the formation of the forum for setting the record straight. That I was very active in it. <laughs> so, of the NDC, and uh, together with other like-minded like colleagues, played a critical role in the 2008 campaign and ultimately led to the electoral victory. He has been involved in every single Congress organization of the NDC since the year 2000. And then since the year 2000, he has served in various capacities uh, at the various Congress of the NDC and uh, chairman of the Protocol and Accreditation Committee, member of the Security Organizations and Event Committees, among others. In 2014, he was virtually in charge of the entire Congress as the then General Secretary, Honorable Esiodin Ketia, also uh, was being contested for the first time. He managed the finances of the party, managed the resources uh, at his dispo disposal very well, rendered accounts to the General Secretary. I think I'll cut it here. And then we'll come to the main work ahead of you. Thank you once again for joining us. Thank Is there you. another very instrument or key uh, role you played I didn't mention, maybe? I mean, I, I've been front and center exactly. of every campaign, you know, apart from 2016 where I didn't really have any official role, but I've been front and center. I've been very, very instrumental. Um, as the profile said, when Professor Mills came back from Canada to come and contest with uh, Professor Kwesi Butri, I was the deputy campaign coordinator. So we took Professor Mills around the whole country. So I know this country very well. And I've done that several times. And then I also became a um, deputy minister for local government. That also gave me the opportunity to go around the country and understand the people. You know, every party has a pulse. And for example, if you want to work with Metro TV and you come for an interview, they will ask you, what do you know about the company? I've sat on several panels. Once you are not able to answer, it means that you've not done your homework well. Yeah. I understand this party. I understand the people. I know the people, I know the pulse of the party, I have extensive networks and relationships that I have built over the years. And do you know the number of contacts I have on my phone? Can you guess? Uh, 1,200. 12,000. What? Yep, 12,000. And 80% of them are party people. Mention any town in Ghana, I'll punch. I have a network. These are relationships that I have built over the years. Becoming a leader 
of the party, and I'm sure we're talking about me aspiring to be the general secretary of the yeah. party, is a people's management affair. And you must understand the people. You must have a relationship with the people. You must have the patience. You must have the ability to understand people, the ability to gel with people, the ability to motivate and inspire people and get them to work. You must have the ability to bring people together. And those are my skills. I've been doing this for a long time. It comes to me as second nature. I don't need to pretend. I don't need to, you know, do. It's, it's just it's part of me. And I started my leadership on the university campus. I was president of the University of Ghana, SRC. That's the premier university. By the grace of God, I was the leader. And in my time, I was fortunately, unfortunately, president for two years because the lecturers went on strike for one year. So I was in that office. We managed the student front. We set up Radio Universe. The Radio Universe you see today, it was called Voice of Legon. It was my administration that got official license permission for that radio station to be set up. So then from there, I became the NUCS coordinating secretary. Now, if you look at the NDC today, the NDC is going through an evolutionary phase. We've had the PNDC, JJ Rollins and his people, may his soul rest in peace. I was very, very, very close to the founder, very close, even though we disagreed strongly yeah. on some issues, especially the last days when he was very close to these people. But I mean, that notwithstanding, you can disagree with your, your, your mentor, but you still love him. I mean, I'm a, a Rollins boy, it's no secret. So I, I, I understand the pulse of people who see themselves as Rollins people. Professor Mills was like a father to me, who were super, super, super close. There's a time that will tell the full story about Professor Mills when he was in South Africa and people claimed he was dead. You recall all yeah, those things. Yeah. You know? I was with him in South Africa. You know, those are stories that we'll tell. So we're super, super close. I understand all the people who worked with him at that time. You know, President Mahama, I was the one who announced him as running mates. Some of us were rooting for him as running mates far back as 2004. We have a very close relationship. I don't, I don't, a relationship. I don't hang around him every day. You see me around him. But yeah. when we meet, the things we talk about, we can't discuss it in public. We have, it's very deep. I have solid relationships with all the senior people the cadets, you know, the senior people, so many, many, many of them who, I mean, I'm talking about personal direct relationship, the Dufours, name them, the Alabis, solid personal relationships. Now, as I said, we've, we're going through an evolution. All these generations came and did their parts. You also have what I call the Generation Z. These are people who are usually more inclined towards social media, and all that. They really were not part of or do not understand how the PNDC evolved into the NDC and all those things. So I am like a bridge between those people, the, the older Rollins generation, the current generation that is us, and then the new emerging, very smart, forward looking people who are disappointed with the MPP, but who see the NDC as an alternative, but they need an anchor. Because I was a lecturer in the university and I have four children. Three of them have completed okay. university. So my house is always full of young people. And I understand them. I know how to communicate with them. I know what makes them tick. And modern campaigning has become very scientific. It's data-driven, research-based, you know, algorithm-based. These are all things that I'm very familiar with. And so with all the experiences that I have, I believe that when I take position as a general secretary, I'll be able to make an impact. And the immediate project is for us to win 2024. Let me, let me just throw this in. So um, it's the general secretary position that you're vying for. But with all that you have said, I see that you're strong as well with, in terms of organizing, bringing people together, getting the job done. You are the grassroots man. Why, why wouldn't you choose to be organizer rather than a general secretary? Okay, so um, the general secretary, if you look at our constitution, the general secretary is the coordinator of all the activities, the women's wing, the youth wing, the everything, the communications, every single aspect. And in fact, he is the manager of the campaign. The entire campaign in our constitution is in black and white. He's a campaign manager. Now, who else than somebody who has been a campaign coordinator for presidential candidates, mm -hmm. who has been a parliamentary candidate, who has been a campaign coordinator for a president, three months campaign, and we won elections, who else? Number two. 
I've been Deputy General Secretary before. The Deputy General Secretary on many occasions when Honorable Asiedun Ketia was out of town, I acted in his stead. Right. So I already have that experience, what it means to be a General Secretary. A General Secretary of a party, which is a Congress, like the NDC, must be somebody who has people skills, who knows how to deal with a wide variety of people. I've talked about the young people, you talk about the business community, I have solid relations because of my work at local government and also because I work with presidential candidates. So mm -hmm. almost all the traditional rulers in Ghana are people that I know personally. I have a close working relationship with them. I'm not talking about just knowing them. They know me, I know them, we talk, okay? If you talk about the Christian community, I was one of the first people by the grace of God in 2012, after Professor Mills passed, where we organized 1,600 of the entire Christian leadership, Catholic, Awoyo, name it, charismatic, Presbyterian, Methodist, Orthodox, 1,600 of them for a breakfast meeting at the Castle Gardens. These are very critical segments of the society. These are networks that we have that we can build upon. When it comes to the Muslim community, a lot of my aides and assistants are Muslims. I have close, direct, personal relationship with the chief imam. He is like a father to me. And so these are all qualities. So it's not um, just a one-track right. personality. I'm, I'm like a footballer who can play with both legs, with the, the right. I'll, I'll, the, I'll throw this in. Um, even though it's nothing, nothing associated to what you're vying for. Because you have been a voice to the youth, and I know you have been rallying around the youth a lot, that the latest issue that has to do with the youth and uh, booing at the president, you, you're good with data and algorithm if you want. And maybe by a gaze you can, and by your experience in politics, you can tell the mood of the country. Uh, there are a few things that's come against the NDC that the NDC was, uh, you know, behind that act of, uh, even though that's just a street comment, maybe I'll put it. How will you describe what happened? And if it were a president that were, uh, was an NDC candidate that was, you know, voted into power by the country, how would you have responded to that? So first of all, I, I, I doubt very much if an NDC president would have sunk to that level. No, an NDC president, an NDC candidate. NDC candidate. Yes, who was voted as president. Yes, so he becomes, okay, he becomes a president. National, national But of course, he's an NDC president. Well, but president. I won't call him an NDC okay. president. Okay, so a president from the NDC stock. Yes. Is I that mean, better? Maybe. Okay, semantics. <laughs> right. You know, um... I have said elsewhere that this government is living in denial. But they also, there's also a strategy behind the denial. Uh, the denial is, first of all, they don't want to accept the reality that they have failed woefully beyond redemption. It's, it's, a, it's a catastrophe. I mean, it's a complete disaster. Those days, when we used to say it, and Atufosun and Honorable Adongo and all of us were saying it, they said it was propaganda. Fitch. Are they NDC? Standard and Poor, are they NDC? All the rating agencies, are they NDC people? There are global parameters and indices of measuring the performance of an economy. When we were in power, we were doing B minus. They said it was unheard of. What was our debt to GDP ratio? 60, 62% thereabout. They said it was unthinkable. What was the debt stock itself? What was in the rate of inflation? You understand me? All these indices were there. And Baumia was running around doing the lectures. And when the fundamentals of your economy are weak, the exchange rate will expose you. By the time we left office, the highest exchange rate, it even went up and came down, was 4.2 to the city. Today, what is the same? So if you look at every single sector of the economy, nothing is working. This government is a fundamental failure, pathetic failure. It's a disaster. What they're doing is that, one, because of hubris, pride, they don't want to accept it. And even when they know that things are so bad, they've developed a strategy where I call it wasn't me, you know, and I use Shaggy's song. Maybe if, song. They have, if they have Shaggy's song, they can play it. It is somebody has been caught red-handed, naked, okay, with a woman having an affair, 
clear evidence. He says it wasn't him. If you play that song now, let your producer can play it and the, the, listen to the lyrics. It's almost as if it's a, it's a kind of insanity, you know. The denial is so brazen that you are in a state of shock because things are not going well. Go to the streets, ask anybody. And I'm not just talking about ordinary people. I'm talking about the business community. We were in Kumasi for about a month. They are suffering more because most of them are business people and traders. They tell us, look, in those days, my, my, my capital was 100,000 CDs. When I change it, I get so much dollars. Now the capital has whistled, whistled down. When I change the same 100,000, I get less. My capital is going away. Nobody is buying. Things are tough, you know? So things are so difficult. And instead of the government accepting that reality and being honest and saying, look, there are challenges and we admit that we may have gotten things wrong. And so let's all rally together and see how we can fix it. In the face of all this, they keep telling us that things are okay. So definitely there's something wrong. Or they will tell you that it's Russia, Ukraine, you know? And Russia, Ukraine, this government alone, this year, according to the Auditor General's report, the money that has not been accounted for is over 17 billion. Was that due to Russia, Ukraine? Cumulatively, over the past few years that they've been in office, They've, the country, there's about 50 billion that is not accounted for. Is that Russia, Ukraine? So Russia, Ukraine is there. And we've done analogy. I mean, every morning on your, you know, your show, we've, we've shown graphics, various countries in the sub-region where their inflation rates and all that are okay. And we, our inflation rate, even the official rates that are, they are giving us, it shows clearly that it's even more than what is being published. So it's a mess. So the president has been living in this denial and he goes to this program in that state of denial and these young people, they react. It was a spontaneous rea reaction. Anybody who says that it was organized, it's, it's, it's living in a cuckoo's land. It wasn't organized. It was a spontaneous reaction. The youth are frustrated, not just the youth, every segment of the Ghanaian society. So everyone. how do you respond to uh, those who say, well, it's disrespectful, we can have any other way to have a conversation about the situation and not necessarily booing the president on, on such a stage? That's a, I'm, I'm, that was I'm, a global stage. I'm, 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 I'm glad that it was only Boeing. It could have been worse. I agree. I agree. It could have, it been, could worse. have been worse. Yeah. It could have been worse. We've seen it in other countries. When leaders lose touch with the people and the people lose confidence in them, they do all kinds of things. You know, people throw water, mm. tomatoes. We've mm. seen it all over the world. So he should be lucky that it's only Boeing. I mean, we, when we were in the university, we organized a lot of demonstrations against this government. So young people, they will speak. And because they don't have any other outlets, that was an opportunity for them to express their disappointment. And it was spontaneous. If you watch the video, you could see that it was spontaneous. If it were organized, you would have seen a particular group, group. of people. It just started and then it built up. So they should just face the reality. They have failed, you know. Um, the only thing is that we are in a democracy and we would just have to wait for 2024, which is very long from a certain context. I mean, we have to go through, and can you imagine, we have to go through 2023? Yes. From January to December. The, but they're working on it. I well, mean, uh, then let's, let's another 2024 the, the from IMF January The IMF intervention to, uh, will come through please, um, give, give, immediately give, give and, and will give us some respite. Give us a break. It's not this, you know, you know, I don't know if you have that diagram on the various ratings and what it means. Yeah. But where we are now, it means that we are in junk status, okay? It's, 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 it's very clear. Mm. We are in junk status. I, I don't know if I have I mean, it. I mean, the latest is a feather junk. Yes. Mm. You know, CC is it's junk CC. and with the threat that we may not be able to pay our debts. And that is why they are talking about, what, restructuring of the debt. Yeah. It's sending signals. And the most frightening thing is that some of the euro bonds and the local uh, uh, bonds that they took are due very soon. Mm -hmm. And what is going to happen? The government is broke. They've eaten all the money. They've eaten all the money. And it's very frightening because in our time, when we had a debt to GDP ratio of about 60% plus, and we had borrowed, they said we had borrowed so much, 126 billion, including from Kwame Nkrumah till when we left office. We had things to show, okay? We have the airports, Kotoka Airport, we have Tamale Airport, we have Kumasi Airport, you know. 
We have all these flyovers to show. We have the hospitals. We have schools, e-block, so much. And what should tell you the, the level of the failure of this government is the fact that when we were leaving office, we had gone into an IMF program. So we took only one tranche mm -hmm. of the money. They came and they took the rest of the two tranches. Beyond that, we had also invested so much in the oil sector. And so we had one oil field during our time. We cumulatively we earned about 5 billion Ghana cities from oil. By the time they took over, we had three oil fields due to investments we had made. Mm -hmm. It wasn't due to any effort they had put in. And that is why before we left office, all the rating agencies and the international analysts said the Ghanaian economy was going to grow by a certain percentage in 2017. If you win power in 2016, and then your results start showing in 2017, 20, what did you do for you to be able to take credit for it? So those were investments that we had made and the policies and programs we had put in. By 2018, when they left the IMF program, when they now had to now use their own initiative, that is where things started sliding. And things started sliding before the Russia-Ukraine war. Things started sliding before COVID. And indeed, the IMF and World Bank had warned that the way the country and the economy was being managed, we were at risk of getting to a place where we get to debt unsustainability. So these are all facts out there. Well, so they should stop this self-delusion, hubris, pride, empty pride, and, and calm down. President Mahama and various senior people have called for a national dialogue. When we were in crisis, and the crisis was not like this one, this was a crisis due to nature, the energy sector. Every seven, ten years or so, the water dries up in Akosombo. President Mama was courageous. He brought Ghanaians together. We discussed. We had a homegrown program. We solved the energy crisis. Okay? That is how you govern. Not in denial, not with arrogance, not with pomposity. It doesn't work. So the hooting, well, is going to continue, unfortunately. People are going to hoot at him. You know, probably. On what grounds are you saying that it's going to continue? Oh, but when people are angry with you and they don't see any hope, you've seen the rains. Have you seen? They say year of roads. Yeah. I don't know about your roads. Where are the roads? Oh, but, but the roads are being, you know, Where? constructed. Which one? I mean, just yesterday, we had uh, the uh, vice president go to Cape Coast and still open some of the roads that he okay, said. I, I was construct. in Cape Coast over the weekend. Most of the inner town roads were done under the NDC. So it's, it's just propaganda, you know. They are, they are not doing anything. And they are storing money, okay, storing for the elections. Where? Where? Eh? Where? About, so where is the money? Is it in your stomach? <laughs> yeah, but if you and don't it, find the money, it doesn't mean they are storing So it. where is it? Because at least we can show you the things we've done with the monies we took, right? Mm -hmm. So one, you can't pay your debts. Huh? You've taken so much money. Where is the money? We can't find it. So definitely the money must be somewhere. And based on what they did in 2024, mm. where they outspent us. I, I was just us. trying to search for the list of the roads. We have the uh, Pokwasi inter interchange completed. We have the Tema, uh, Tamale interchange completed. We have Obechebi. It's not an interchange. We it's a flyover. A, a flyover. Thank you for the correction. Th those are flyovers. PCC. Okay. So all of the ones that um, uh, it, it's tacked interchange. And it's not an interchange. It's, it's a flyover. A it's flyover. Just, it's flyover. Just, it's just, it's just the, the, if you want an interchange, you go to Circle. That's a proper interchange. interchange. You go to Kaswa. That's an interchange. That's what we call an interchange, not a flyover. Okay. Right. And so most of these projects, we mm -hmm. found the resources. For example, if you take the, the, uh -huh. the Tamale Airport and Kumasi Airport projects, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for example, I mean, we did the design, everything. We found the funding. And then when we came to power, the funding sources changed. Okay? But it was the same concept, the same design, everything. So what's the big deal here? What's the big deal here? So they have nothing to show. It's just talk, planting for food and jobs. It says the fertilizer has been carried by donkeys to Ooh. Burkina Faso. The, the agri minister who wants to be president, 
<laughs> it's let's, come, a, let's come back to good. you Yankas. took me there so yes I'm, because i wanted you to address i wanted to pick your mind on what are the youth and their response to the current okay. administration mm. so back to you as a, a general secretary candidate so i i know i don't want to mention names because you are here but you know in those days when you were doing certain record streets you had personalities that you uh, agreed with and you had successful uh, continuous press conferences or addressing the media or what's going on in the country and today you stand at different positions vying for the same seats or office you know how is that looking like because i think uh, the the communication out there is that oh there's fire in the ndc no. you know at chairmanship position at secretary uh, position as well no, there's no fire. Is there, is there any fire? Where's the fire? <laughs> no, I want to say fire. It's, we it's, won't literally it's, see it's, fire. It's, 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 um, Johnson Esedun Ketia, Honorable, has been in that office for 17 years. Um, I was privileged to work closely with him, very, 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 very closely. Um, I served as his deputy. And many times when he was out of the country, I acted in his stead. I have understood him. I understand the job. Um, I know the pulse of the NDC. I have the necessary networks. I have built relationships that I believe will inure to the benefit of the NDC going into 2024. I have the temperament and the uh, mindset to be able to handle the complex um, issues in the party. You know, the NDC is a Congress, as I keep saying, it's very complex. So you must have a certain disposition, you know. I know how to listen because a leadership is not just talk, 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 talk. You must also know how to listen. Listening is an art. And I listen. I recall just two days ago, I was a very senior person, business person, and he started talking, and I took my phone. He said, I said, no. I started putting down notes because whilst he was talking, I was picking some very, very important ideas. Right? So listening is part of leadership i know how to listen and of course i know when to be firm that one i'm well known mm. for it so i believe that both from my personal qualities my background and experience um my academic background and all the things that i've done over the years i'm strategically positioned to take over from Esedun Ketia and help the party win the 2024 elections, which is the next most important agenda. Now, um, when I was appointed director of elections, and I say this with trepidation because it can easily be misunderstood, our goal was not to do well. Our goal was to win the 2020 elections. And we'll put in place all the mechanisms and machines. How is that? Not to do well, but to win the 2020 elections. Yes, yes. And when I, I, I'll explain. Mm. Because eventually I'm going to tell you that we did well. Okay. If I don't preface it with that, okay. it will seem as if we were okay with doing well. Okay. okay. You know? Okay. So in, you have to be very careful when you're communicating. Otherwise, Havana headline, I am happy we did well. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> we went into win. We had 106 seats. MPP had come into office and Ananado for the first time. Usually, when parties go to opposition for the first time, they don't do that well. Now look at our performance. In Parliament, we move from 106 seats to 142 seats. Those are the seats we won, 142. But in five places, Takwan Swayam, Esikado Ketan, Techiman, Sefiri also, and one other place in the north, they use violence, intimidation, for example, in Takwan Swayam, they recounted the votes at the coalition center, I mean, countless times, which is not allowed by law. It is not allowed. A Cicado Ketan, the same thing, and they put off, put off the lights. Immediately, the lights went off, ballot boxes were switched. So all these things, the violence, intimidation, uh, together with the coalition of the electoral commission, in spite of all that, and the fact that they outspent us by a ratio of, I'll say, a thousand to one, they, they spent so much money. I'm sure you've heard the MPP vice chairperson who said that she alone got one million. That's just from one source. Mm -hmm. She hasn't talked about what came from Flagstaff House, what came from the party, etc. 
in so, terms of the COVID for, funds? Yes. Audio. So for every uh, thousand or one million that they spend, we were spending like 50,000. So you can imagine, in spite of all that, we got 142 seats. Even if you had to go by the official declaration, we got 137 seats. That's a huge improvement because the MPP had 169 seats. We reversed it. Again, we were in power in 2020. We had 44.3%. Our numbers went up. We reversed the 1 million vote deficit and our numbers went up. I'm saying that that was not our objective. Our objective was to win. But if you look at the numbers, if you're doing the statistical analysis, you realize that we have improved. And so if the momentum is now on our side, if we correct a few things, if we put a few things in place, and those are things that I know as director of elections, which I'm not prepared to discuss publicly, when I meet the delegates, I explain to I them. I was tempted to ask you, but I thought. No, <laughs> I thought I'll twice. tell you. It's a delegates <laughs> conference. Right. When I meet the delegates, I'll tell them, I'll show them what went wrong, you know, what we didn't do right, what we could have done better, certain things we should have put in place. Those are lessons. It's also part of leadership, the ability to realize that things could have been done better. You know, in, for example, in our communication, anytime I go and look at our achievements, I become very sad. I mean, and when I engage people, you know, because we are in position and everybody is suffering, so we engage a lot of people. And when you engage them and you begin to tell them, like, well, we did this, we did that, we did that, we did that. They're like, ah, but you did all these things, and somehow we didn't know. And I think that we allowed... In terms of, of, of uh, development. Yes. But you had Green Book. Yeah, but you can have the Green Book, but, you know, the, 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 the strategy of the communication, the persistence, and the consistency. And, and I think the MPP were very aggressive with their falsehood, you know, and I'm saying that we should be more proactive and aggressive with our truth and facts. The facts are on our side. Right. We take every single sector. We, we have performed tremendously. You cannot dispute that. With what we had, we have performed so well. And yeah, those are some end, of the we, things. We, we judged. Yes, but I'm we saying... We marked you down. No, but I'm saying that if you, you do an analysis, and we've done post-election analysis, and that's one thing that hasn't really happened in... in, in, in to, uh, after the elections, went around every region, brought all the constituencies, and we did thorough analysis. Every constituency gave us a report of what happened, etc., etc. So, with all that experience, we are in poor position to put in place mechanisms to ensure that certain things that happen will not happen again, and then we are good to go. Right. So we're having a chit chat with the uh, General Secretary hopeful of the NDC, Elvis Efriye Ankara, a very uh, tall experience that he shares with us. When we are back from the break, we'll be, you know, touching on a few things that he intends to do should he win as a General Secretary when the party goes, the Congress goes for their Congress. <laughs> we'll be back shortly. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to Good Afternoon, oh Ghana. Goodness. Was that you? Let me confirm. Oh my goodness. This was, this was me doing freestyle. <laughs> A friend of mine, Kwesi Bako, from yeah. the States, he came to mm -hmm. launch his reggae album. Yeah. So when I got there, they asked me to say a few words and then oh, you know i just that was decided your to do, freestyle yeah did it some couldn't freestyle. have been any word but of course now <laughs> you know you know sometimes when i, I preach you know yeah. so sometimes when i pick the mic i have to be careful not ah, to say hey job this one says a good afternoon elvis and free and christ the people's choice mm -hmm. and the choice of god mm -hmm. he is best fit for the position of the general secretary of the ndc he is well vexed and has the political experience to become the chief executive officer of the ndc this is from David Edu, Tema West Constituency sends that in. Someone also says, Annie, can you please ask him about the sports ministry of how many times? Say 
for the last time, maybe say something about it. When you were at the sports, in fact, me, what I heard, word on the street was that the president at the time was being biased towards you and that we had an issue we're dealing with, and then he saved you by taking you into his armpit, by taking you to the pre presidency and making you a minister of state. Then he probably saw the qualities I had. <laughs> but on a more serious note, what kind of bias is it that will make I was, there was a public inquiry carried live on TV for three months. Did it affect you? Of course, I'm human, but I've recovered. I'm, I've, it's way, way behind me. And the more importantly, there was a report. After the Would you kindly said. ask anybody who is interested? I know it's voluminous, but they can take their time and read. Hmm? A report, official report. Nothing against me. Because there were systemic issues. So anybody who is interested can either go and look at the reports or look at the numerous interviews I've granted explanations. There's really nothing to answer. There's nothing. We've moved on. But at the time you years. were there, is there anything you did that today benefited the sports ministry or the sports fraternity? Oh, huge. If I want to begin to talk about what we did, and that's the thing, you know, everybody talks about the negatives. But if I were to start talking about the things that we did, we won so many, many, many medals in boxing, badminton, for example. I'll give you one typical case study of the kind of approach I was using. I was there one afternoon when the National Tennis Federation came to see me, very desperate. They were going to be expunged from the International Tennis Federation with very serious consequences. They had not paid their subscription for six years. So there and then I called my friend Coleman, and then he said, look, let's talk to Magdan. So I sent the team to go and meet Magdan. That is how Magdan Tennis was, came into being. So he paid a subscription and then subsequently set up Magdan and he continued to support them. Now, you know, in my time, government didn't have money for the supporters. So we raised money ourselves from corporate Ghana. So the idea was that we would then look at each of the sports. So if you take... Um, this company, Magdan, is taking tennis. You look at boxing, you look for a cluster of companies, they take boxing. You look for another cluster of companies, they take swimming. And okay. if you talk to the Swimming Federation, I was personally supporting them. And recently, when they won a laurel, they sent me a video and they thanked me. So there were so many, many things. The amputees team, I was supporting them. Hockey, so many, many, many. And I, I, can, I can give you the list so that you can... Uh, this okay, we'll I didn't know we were going to talk about mm. sports here. All right. So um, let's go on to, with a few minutes we have, uh, what you, when you're able to, you know, grab that office, what are you going to bring? You have already earlier on talked about the faces the NDC is going through. What are you finally going to land the NDC in as a general secretary when you become, when you win? So my sports? biggest strength is my ability to work with people. That's one of my biggest strengths, the ability to just bring everybody. You know, leadership, a leader is not one who knows everything, but a leader is one who is able to identify people who know even better than him and brings them together to achieve a common purpose. So that's the ability that I have. It just comes to me naturally. And number two, I said that, I mean, and kudos to Sami Jemfi and his team. They're doing an extremely human's job, but definitely we can do better, okay? And it's not about individuals, it's about the structure, the system and the strategy. So, as I said, there's so much that we've done that people do not even know. If you build schools, markets in a particular community, people don't know on the other side. We need to find a way of getting people to understand that when we were in power, we were able to achieve so much. And in Ghanaian politics today, whether you like it or not, the language factor has become very crucial. 70% of the radio stations, if not more, I can't dominate it. You can't run away from it. It's a reality, okay? And in Ghana, look at the number of regions, you know, Central, Western, even Accra, because it's cosmopolitan. Akan is well-spoken, Ashanti, Eastern, just name it. Bono. So over 60, 70% of the regions are Akan dominated. I was in Tamale the last time, and some of the programs even have Akan sessions. So it's a very important factor. And the General Secretary, you are the chief spokesperson of the party. I speak, read, and write Akan properly, okay? Both a Kriapim tree and a, a, a Santi tree. I speak, read, and write, okay? I speak, read, and write ever. I'm an Anglo man. My mother is Anglo, 
Okay, it's my father who is Ashanti or my Hinema Kokobe. I'm a Gama, I have garrots. Okay, so I speak the Gam proper. You understand know I me? Mean? So when I get to my Gam people, I know how to communicate to them. I'm from Oti. Do the Papa say in Oti region? So these are all connections and networks that. You As need. general secretary, I'll be able to draw. And I've told you about my links with traditional authority, the Christian community, the Muslim community. Apart from that, is a understanding what, what I do privately, even though it's small. When you say this, yeah. people will think that, oh, you have some big group. No, small. I do consultancy for candidates. Okay. Political in, candidates? Yes. For in what? other countries. Oh, okay. Like I said, small, one or two B. Other countries. In one or in two In fact, B. I will join those people who say it's not small. One or two B, okay? <laughs> uh, most of them my friends. And modern campaigning is about research. It's data-driven, okay? There are algorithms that you can use to determine you, and your behavior and your preferences. And messages can be packaged to suit you. I don't want to be tempted to go into the details, but... All these are modern tools and approaches. I've taken time to study the various consultancy firms that have helped Trump to win elections, that have helped other countries to win elections. I don't want to mention some of them, you know. And I've studied them, their methodology, how they operate, and all that, and their results, and their track, rec track, their, their track record. And there is something that can be learned from all those things. So these are things that, it, it is my life. This is what I do, okay? So how will these, when you win, uh, translates into the national picture itself, so you are the general benefiting secretary. the country. You are the at general large. secretary. You are coordinating the general secretary per constitution is a campaign coordinator. So you direct the 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 the, the, the policy and and the strategy of the party. You get inputs from everybody, and then you direct. You push things. This this is happening. This is happening. So that is what is going to help the party. First phase is to win the 2024 elections because if you don't win the elections, you cannot govern the country. So should phase you win, one should is you to win. win as general secretary. Um, with the current situation that Ghana is in, we have listened to analysts who have predicted that uh, we cannot even restore the state of the economy in the next three years or four years. Should you win and should NDC uh, eventually win the coming elections? What is going to be, what we should be looking out for? So what will you be seeing is the NDC now put a team of knowledgeable, competent people together. That will do a thorough assessment of the situation. And we have the brains, we have the people who have the capacity have the to men. do. That's why I said brains, because <laughs> as for the men, we know that we had grandfathers and grands and you know <laughs> and, and 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 then um our former president has even given an, an indication which the party is going to adopt going into the 2024 manifesto we're going to cut down drastically on the size of ministers that's a major 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 initiative we've talked about reviewing the constitution, the constitutional review process started, is stalled because there were legal issues, etc. Because part of the problem we have is the structure right. Right. Okay, of our governance. Mm -hmm. The governance is too tilted towards the executive. So when you review the constitution, there, there's another one which is my pet project, this is. which is reviewing funding of political parties. Oh. That one is my pet project, and I'll wait till I win, <laughs> you know, and we come to power. Then we'll talk about that. Those are things. And then we'll stop the bleeding. You see, right now what is happening is that it is like somebody bleeding profusely. And yet nothing is being done being to stop, done. stop the bleeding. And it's like somebody having a drum of water and the perforations are growing bigger and the water is leaking out. So it doesn't matter how much water you pour in, it right. goes out. First thing is to stop the leakage. When you stop the leakage, then you can now determine what goes in, where to come from, and then from there, development will progress. So these are the general principles that would underpin our governance.
Well, uh, we'll look forward to that. Elvis Efri Ankara is a general secretary hopeful for the NDC. We'll be following through with your campaign and we wish you all the best. I'm sure we'll have uh, some one time with you again before uh, you finally go for your Congress. When I'm announced as general secretary. Uh, when you're announced, no, 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 no. Before you're announced. So thank you so much for coming thank through. So My name is Anya Fompofo. Thank you for staying with us. We'll be back on Friday. <laughs> Tu es là 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 Tu es là